a very good evening aspirants i have an important announcement regarding your prelims and mains preparation three exciting opportunities are knocking on your doors to assist you in achieving your dream of clearing the upsc civil services examination we are here to help you in your prelims and mains preparation those who have missed to enroll into the most reliable prelims test series offered by shankar ias academy your wait is over pre stroming batch 3 is starting on november 9th the first test in this batch will commence on 20th november like the other batches it will also have 66 tests now for mains examination you all are aware about the mains booster 2023 under which you will be provided 40 mains oriented test in 90 days the booster is a quick plan drafted for you to boost your main score. It starts tomorrow that is on October 31st and will include sectional test, half papers and civil service examination emulators. It is available in both online and offline modes for just 4500 rupees. On top of that, we are launching a new initiative called SA Augmentar 2023 from today. Under this initiative, you will be provided with four tests to enhance your essays. It is also available in both online and offline modes. You will get a different approach towards essay writing along with pre-essay and post-essay discussions. To further enhance the content of essays, you will be provided with a summarized reference material combined with mentorship. All these for just 6000 rupees. Grab these chances to kickstart your prelims and mains exam preparation. With this happy note, now let's move on to the Hindu news analysis for the date 30th of October 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. You can go through it. Now, without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. C talks about the violation of model code of conduct by a Telangana minister ahead of a by election in the state. And the election commission has issued a notice to him demanding an explanation. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the model code of conduct in detail. See, the model code of conduct refers to a set of guidelines issued by the Election Commission of India for the conduct of political parties and candidates during elections. It is primarily a set of rules to rule out any unruly behavior by the political parties and the members associated with it during the time of elections. Now coming to the evolution of model code of conduct, see historically the credit of giving idea of model code for political parties should go to state of Kerala. It adopted the code of conduct for the first time in observance for political parties during the general election to the state legislative assembly in February 1960. See a draft code was voluntarily approved by the representatives of the leading political parties of the state at a meeting which was specially convened for the purpose by the state government. See this code has covered in detail about the important aspects of electioneering like meetings and processions, speeches and slogans, posters and placards etc. Then during general election to Lok Sabha and simultaneous elections to several state assemblies in 1962, the election commission circulated the code to all the recognized political parties and it proved to be effective in conducting of election campaigns in peaceful and orderly atmosphere in the country. Then the political parties by and large followed the code. Then the 1991 general election was a watershed event in the course of evolution of model code. That year model code was further amplified and reissued. So this is all about the evolution of model code of conduct. Now let us see few additional facts relating to model code of conduct. See the model code of conduct has been evolved over the past six decades with the consensus of political parties who have consented to abide by the principles. The most important thing to note here is that it does not have any statutory backing in any law. See it comes into force from the announcement of the date of elections and remains in force till the results are announced. Now let us see some of the code of conduct which has to be followed. Firstly, political parties and contesting candidates should not use religious places for election campaign. Then such speeches should not be delivered in a way that it create hatred among different communities belonging to different religions, castes and languages etc. Then official machinery should not be used for election work. Also no new grants can be sanctioned and no new schemes or projects can be started once the election dates are announced. And finally one cannot misuse mass media for partisan coverage. 
So these are all some of the codes that has to be followed. Now coming to the question, what happens when the model code of conduct are violated? See, the Election Commission of India has no legal backing to punish the offenders for the violation of model code of conduct. However, certain provisions of the model code of conduct can be administered legally by invoking corresponding provisions in other laws. So, the violations need to be conjured with statutes under the Indian Penal Code 1860, Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 and Representation of the People Act 1951. But obviously, this is not sufficient as there are too many violations of Model Code of Conduct in the country during elections. Remember here, the news article also deals with breach of Model Code of Conduct by the Telangana Minister. So, the legal experts are of the opinion that Model Code of Conduct should be provided with legal backup and stringent punishments for the violations of it to keep a check on the continuous offenders. That's all regarding this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about the evolution of model code of conduct, then some code of conduct that has to be followed and the importance of providing legal backing to model code of conduct. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. This news article reports about contempt of court. See, a contempt of court petition was filed against Mr. Rangarajan Narasimhan by the senior counsel Mr. Venus Srinivasan. The Madras High Court has closed the contempt of court petition after Mr. Rangarajan Narasimhan gave an unconditional apology to the High Court. So, this is about the news article. Although the news is not very relevant, contempt of court is very important for your examination. So, in our discussion, today we will focus on contempt of court. Before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here for your reference. Kindly go through it. First, let's see how the concept of contempt of court originated. See this concept originated in England. In England, several centuries ago, the judicial power was vested with the king. That is, the king served as the judge. At that time, there was no separation of powers. So, to protect this judicial power of the king, the concept of contempt of court originated. Then after some time, the concept of separation of power emerged. At that time, steps were taken to separate the judiciary from the executive. So, the judicial authority was vested in a panel of judges who acted in the name of king. Since the judges acted on behalf of the king, the violation of the orders of the judges was considered an outrageous act against the king himself. So, anyone disobeying the orders of the judiciary were held in contempt of court. So, this is how the concept of contempt of court evolved. So, at present, disobedience to judges or obstruction of the implementation of their directives become punishable for contempt of court. This also included comments and actions that showed disrespect towards the courts as well. Now, what is the objective behind the concept of contempt of court? See, it is to safeguard the interest of the public because if the authority of the court is belittled, then public confidence in the administration of justice will be weakened or eroded. This might result in the collapse of the entire judicial system. So, the concept of contempt of court is necessary for the judiciary to function smoothly. See, contempt of court can be of two kinds. One is civil contempt and the other is criminal contempt. First, let's take civil contempt. A yeah, civil contempt means willful disobedience to any judgment, decree, direction, order, writ or other process of a court or willful breach of an undertaking given to a court. This is about civil contempt. Now, moving on to criminal contempt. A criminal contempt means the publication of any matter or doing any other act which scandalizes or lowers the authority of any court. Here the term scandalizing the court refers to something that brings the authority and administration or law by the courts into disrepute, creating distrust and disbelief in the minds of the public at large. A criminal contempt case also includes the publication of any matter which interferes with the due course of any judicial proceeding or obstructs the administration of justice in any other manner. Here the publication could be by words, spoken or written or by signs or by visible representations. So basically, the difference between civil and criminal contempt is that in case of civil contempt, the order of the court is not followed and in the case of criminal contempt, the authority of the court is lowered. Having covered the basics, now let's see constitutional and statutory basis regarding contempt of court. First is Article 129 of the Indian Constitution. See, Article 129 declares the Supreme Court as a court of record and the Supreme Court shall have all the powers of a court of record including the power to punish for its contempt of itself. Next is Article 142, Class 2. 
See, it states that the Supreme Court has all and every power to make any order for the purpose of securing the attendance of any person, the discovery or production of any documents, or the investigation or punishment of any contempt of itself. So, basically, Article 142, Class 2 of the Indian Constitution empowers the Supreme Court's verdicts and rulings to be enforced. The Article 142, Class 2 also states that while performing its duty, the Supreme Court may issue any verdict or order which is necessary to provide complete justice. So, this is regarding provisions that empowers the Supreme Court. As far as the High Court, we have Article 215. See, Article 215 declares High Courts as a court of record and that it shall have all the powers of such a court including the powers to punish for contempt for itself. So, these are all the constitution provisions regarding contempt of court. In addition to this, we also have a statutory provision under Contempt of Courts Act 1971. But what is the necessary for this act? See, if you notice carefully, although Article 129, 142 Class 2 and 215 mentions Contempt of Court, it does not define what Contempt of Court is. So, it is the Contempt of Court Act 1971 which defines what is Contempt of Court. We saw the types of Contempt of Court, right? They are defined by the Contempt of Court Act 1971. See, civil contempt is mentioned under Section 2B of the Contempt of Court Act and the criminal contempt is mentioned under Section 2C of the Act. Here, the punishment for the contempt of court is also provided in this Act. According to the Act, contempt of court punishes the guilty person with imprisonment that may extend to 6 months or fine of rupees 2000 or both. See, the Act also provides some protection against the contempt of court proceedings. As per Section 3, innocent publication and distribution of matter is not contempt. That is, a person will not be guilty for anything published in connection with any pending civil or criminal proceeding if at the time of publishing the person was not aware that the case was pending in court. Then as per Section 4, fair and accurate report of judicial proceedings is not contempt. That is, a person shall not be guilty of contempt of court for publishing a fair and accurate report of judicial proceedings. Then most importantly under section 5, fair criticism of judicial action is not contempt. That is, a person shall not be guilty of contempt of court for publishing any fair comment on the merits of any case which has been heard and finally decided by the court. Then there is section 13. Section 13 states that no court shall impose a sentence unless it is satisfied that the contempt substantially interferes with the due course of the justice. So basically, only if the court is satisfied that the contempt interferes with the due course of justice, the court can award a punishment for contempt of court. Finally, there is section 20. Section 20 places a time limit to initiate contempt of court case proceedings. Section 20 places a limit of one year from the date on which the contempt is alleged to have been committed. After this period of one year, contempt of court proceedings cannot be initiated. So, this is all with respect to constitutional and statutory basis regarding contempt of court. Now, let's see the necessity of contempt of court one by one. See, the contempt of court is necessary to ensure the supremacy of the judiciary. In a young democratic country like India, the judiciary is the last option of hope for the citizens. So, maintenance of supremacy of the judiciary is a necessity. Then, the existence of civil contempt helps ensure that court's orders are obeyed. If court's orders are not obeyed, then our society might slip into chaos. Then, contempt of court helps protect the judiciary from personal attacks. If the judges are subjected to personal attacks, their judgment might get tainted. Then for the proper delivery of justice, the judgments must be made by independent judges without any biases. Currently in our country, even though there is a separate law dealing with the contempt of court, the issue of trial by media is on the rise. The advent of 24 hours news channels has only amplified the problem. These news channels are functioning based on their vested interest. So, if there is no contempt of court act, these news channels will push the country into complete mob rule. Then, India continues to have a high number of criminal contempt cases, which validates the necessity of the presence of contempt laws. Finally, although the contempt of court was enacted in 1971, the constitution makers included it in our original constitution in Article 129, 142 and 215. So, there is a need for contempt of court in our country. Although it has its merits, it also has some demerits associated with it. Justice Fali S. Nariman once famously said, criminal contempt has fallen into disuse in most of the civilized countries around the world, but not in India. So, there are some issues with it. Now, let's see some issues. Firstly, the contempt of court is against the fundamental rights guaranteed under Article 14 and 19. See, contempt of court provisions has some features that stifle our right to freedom of speech and expression. 
so basically in a democracy even the courts have to be tolerant towards criticism this is the first issue the next issue is that the language used in contempt of court act 1971 is very vague since the language is vague the courts can interpret the provisions liberally to prevent constructive criticism as well in some cases the contempt also violates the principle of natural justice there are various instances in which the judges acted according to their self interest so this is against the principle of natural justice then some use the contempt of court proceedings as judicial overreach see we have incorporated the concept of contempt of court from the british but right now contempt laws have been abolished from the united kingdom itself so some people are of opinion that the concept of contempt of court does not find a place in modern democracy finally there is the issue of overburden already our judiciary is plagued with a huge backlog so the high number of contempt cases pending in various high courts and the supreme court further overburden the judiciary so to conclude we can say that the scope of the contempt must be limited to willful disobedience of directions or judgments of the court also steps must be taken to remove the scandalizing the court part and the language defining contempt must be more clear so that the discretion in interpretation can be avoided so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the origin of contempt of court its objectives then the types of contempt then about the constitutional and statutory provisions and finally about the merits and demerits of contempt of court with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article given here this news article talks about the uniform civil code the news is that in the last cabinet meeting the gujarat government moved a proposal to constitute a committee to evaluate all aspects of implementing the uniform civil code see this move is similar to the move taken by the uttarakhand government recently this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about uniform civil code in detail first of all what is uniform civil code see it is nothing but a code which encompasses a single personal law for all citizens irrespective of religion sex gender and sexual orientation the uniform civil code calls for the formulation of one law for india regarding civil cases that is the uniform civil code envisions a single law that is applicable to all religious communities in matters such as marriage divorce inheritance adoption etc and note that this uniform civil code comes under article 44 of the indian constitution so what does article 44 say the article lays down that the state shall endeavor to secure a uniform civil code for the citizens throughout the territory of india but what is the situation prevalent in india see in india personal laws are based on religion see these laws apply to a certain group of people based on their religion caste faith and belief and they are made after due consideration of customs and religious texts to get an idea just have a look at these personal laws that are present in india like the hindu marriage act 1955 the hindu succession act 1956 the hindu minority and guardianship act 1956 the muslim personal law shariat application act 1937 and then dissolution of muslim marriages act 1939 and the waqaf act 1955 from these examples what can we infer we can infer that there are laws existing for personal matters based on religion so now the question is why everyone is talking about uniform civil code what is the need for uniform civil code in india the answer is the disadvantages of personal laws now let's see them one by one First of all these personal laws are exactly the opposite of secularism so to promote secularism we need uniform civil code secondly the personal laws are discriminatory in nature for example if you take muslims they are governed by muslim laws whereas hindus they are governed by hindu laws and hence these laws will not be the same so the benefits that are enjoyed by a person in one religion is different from the benefits that are enjoyed by a person in another religion and this is discrimination right and this is why we need uniform civil code thirdly we need uniform civil code to promote women empowerment see some laws are extremely patriarchal and misogynistic here misogynistic means strong hatred against women this leads to subjugation and mistreatment of women to avoid this we need uniform civil code fourthly overlapping provisions in different laws can be avoided and finally uniform civil code will help accelerate the process of national integration and it would create a sense of oneness that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the uniform civil code and the need for uniform civil code in india 
with these learned points now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article the news article says that on the unsc committee's meeting in mumbai our additional secretary of ministry of home affairs mentioned that between 2018 to 2021 when pakistan was placed in financial action task force grey list the number of terror bases across the jammu and kashmir border reduced by 75 percentage but since 2021 again the terror bases are on the rise it has increased by 50 percentage the background here is that earlier this month the fatf that is the financial action task force removed pakistan from the grey list of countries so by highlighting the relative peace that existed between 2018 to 2021 when pakistan listed under grey list india asked for the continued list of pakistan in the grey list so this is about the crux of the news article in this context let us learn about fatf in prelims perspective first of all what is fatf see the financial action task force which is shortly known as fatf is the global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog it was founded in the year 1989 by the initiative of g7 countries here know that g7 or group of 7 is an intergovernmental organization consisting of canada france germany italy japan the united kingdom and the united states now coming back to fatf see fatf is an intergovernmental body it sets up international standards that aims at preventing the illegal activities of money laundering and terrorist financing and also to prevent the harmful terrorist activities in addition to this the fatf works to generate the necessary political will to bring out national legislative and regulatory reforms in these areas know that the fatf secretariat is located at organization for economic cooperation and development that is oecd headquarters in paris currently the fatf has 39 members including two regional organizations such as european commission and gulf cooperation council know that india is also a member of the fatf now what does fatf do see the fatf has developed the fatf standards these standards helps develop a coordinated global response to prevent organized crime corruption and terrorism they help authorities go after the money of criminals dealing in illegal drugs human trafficking and other crimes the fatf also works to stop funding for weapons of mass destruction and it reviews money laundering and terrorist financing techniques and continuously strengthens its standards to address new risks here the new risks are nothing but the spread of digital currencies and cryptocurrencies etc the fatf also monitors countries to ensure they implement the fatf standards fully and effectively and holds countries accountable so far we have seen about fatf and its functions now let's learn about the important lists under fatf first let's see about the gray list see the countries that are considered to be a safe haven for supporting terror funding and money laundering are put in the fatf gray list This inclusion serves as a warning to the country that it may enter into the black list. See this list is also formally called as other monitored jurisdictions. When a country is placed in this list, it becomes extremely difficult for that country to get financial aid from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the European Union. So this is about gray list. Now let's move on to the next list. It is nothing but the black list. This list is formally called as call for action. See black list is a list of countries that the FATF considers non cooperative in the global effort to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. These countries support terror funding and money laundering activities. See the FATF revises the black list regularly adding or deleting entries. As of October 2022 only 3 countries are in the list. They are Iran, North Korea and Myanmar. Know that Myanmar was added very recently. Now let's see what happens when a country is blacklisted. A blacklisted country may be subject to economic sanctions by a member of FATF. Also transactions involving those countries will be subject to more levels of scrutiny by banks. So this might discourage companies from doing business in the blacklisted countries. So this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about FATF, its functions and about the two lists of FATF. With these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article it speaks about kala namak rice the news is that
Kala Namak rice, which is traditionally tall, is now redeveloped with dwarf properties by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute to address the issue of lodging. In this context, let us learn about Kala Namak rice in detail. Now first, let's see a brief history of Kala Namak rice. See, Kala Namak, which literally means black salt, is one of the finest quality of aromatic rice grown in India. This scented variety has been cultivated since 600 BC, that is probably before the Buddhist era. See, Kala Namak rice is also known as Buddha rice as it is believed that Buddha broke his fast on the day of enlightenment when Kheer made from Kala Namak rice was offered to him. So, this is about the history of Kala Namak rice. Now, let's see the property of the rice. See, Kala Namak is a black colored rice. Traditional varieties of the rice were tall and were prone to lodging. Here, lodging means a condition in which the top of the plant becomes very heavy because of grain formation, which subsequently makes the stem weak and the plant falls on the ground. The bending over of the stems near ground level of grain crops makes them very difficult to harvest and can dramatically reduce yield. So, to address this problem, Recently, Indian Agriculture Research Institute introduced dwarf varieties of the Kala Namak rice. Now, coming to the geographical extent, see Kala Namak rice is grown widely in UP's Terai belt. See, the Terai or Tarai is a lowland region in northern India and southern Nepal that lies south of the outer foothills of the Himalayas, the Shivalik Hills and the north of Indo-Gangetic Plain. This lowland belt is characterized by tall grasslands, sal forests and clay lich swamps. So, this is where the Kala Namak rice grows. Now, let's see few additional facts regarding Kala Namak rice. See, it is known for its medicinal and curative properties. It is rich in antioxidants and has a high anthocyanin content that helps in the prevention of heart disease and improves the health of the skin. As the rice is rich in iron and zinc, it helps in regulating blood-related problems. Recent research has shown that Kala Namak rice is excellent for diabetic patients and must be included in their daily meals. See, the export potential of Kala Namak rice is huge. The Kala Namak rice commands a higher price than Basmati rice by roughly about 4 to 5 times higher. Due to its long standing association with Buddha, it is becoming more famous as holy rice. The aroma of the Kala Namak rice, originating from the villages of Siddhartha Nagar, has now started reaching countries that practice Buddhism, namely, Japan, Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and Bhutan. So, this is all with respect to Kala Namak rice. In this discussion, we saw about Kala Namak rice, its properties and a few additional facts. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now, look at this first question. With reference to model code of conduct, consider the following statements. Let's take up the first statement. Model Code of Conduct is released by the Election Commission of India. Here, this statement is absolutely correct. Yes, Model Code of Conduct is a set of guidelines issued by Election Commission of India. So, the statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement. It has legal backing in the Representation of People's Act 1951. Here, this statement is incorrect. As we saw from our discussion, MCC has no legal backing. If you know this fact, you can even eliminate the statement 3. Here, the statement 3 says, Violation of MCC automatically amounts to the corrupt practices specified under Section 123 of the Representation of People Act 1951. So, the statement is incorrect. Now, coming to the fourth statement. It comes into force from the date of announcement of the election and stays in force till the actual date of the election. Here, this statement is also incorrect. The first part is correct. That is, it comes into force from the date of announcement of election. But, it stays in force till the date of the result. Here it mentioned actual date of election. So, this statement is also wrong. Here the statement 1 is alone correct and the other 3 statements are wrong. Here the question asks for correct statement. So, the correct answer for the question is option A, 1 only. Moving on to the second question. With reference to Uniform Civil Code, 2 statements are given. Let's take up the first statement. Establishing Uniform Civil Code is one of the directive principles of state policy. Here the statement is correct. This is what mentioned in Article 44 and it is one of the directive principle of state policy. So, the statement 1 is correct. Now, coming to the second statement. It promotes national integration and secularism. Yes, this statement is also correct. It promotes national integration and secularism because 
it shuts down all the discriminations created by the other personal laws. So here the question asks for correct statements. So the answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Moving on to the third question. Consider the following pairs. Here the GA tag, rice and the areas where it is grown is given. We have to pick the correct pairs. Look at this first pair, Pokali rice, Kerala. Yes, this pair is correct. Pokali is a unique saline tolerant rice that is cultivated using extensive aquaculture in an organic way in the waterlogged coastal regions that spread in about 500 acres in Alapura, Trishur and Ernakulam districts of Kerala in southern India. So the first pair is correct. Now look at the second pair. Kala Namak Rice, Uttar Pradesh. Yes, it is correct, which we have seen in discussion itself. Now coming to the third pair, Judima, Azam. This is also correct. Here note that Judima rice is widely used in the wine industry in parts of Kirby Anglong region of Azam. So the third pair is also correct. Now coming to the fourth pair, Chak Hao Manipur. This pair is also correct. It is a type of black rice and it is widely grown in parts of Manipur. So the question asks for correctly matched pairs. So the correct answer for the question is option D. All four pairs are correct. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. Display here is the main question for you today. Go to the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we come to the end of the video. If you like our analysis, please like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar Ayes Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.